Hi everyone. Uh, yep, my name's Maya and I am going to tell you how to avoid meetings. Actually, that's a total lie. I'm going to tell you to have a whole heap of meetings without having meetings. That's what I'm actually going to tell you. Um, so uh, here is a, a thing from a Gartner report from about 10, 12 years ago about globalized workforces. Uh, who here has worked with uh, either a distributed or an international team? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, hello, welcome capitalism. Uh, it's kind of changing the way it's being done all over the world in that it's stopped being just uh, outsourcing and started being more collaborative. And a lot of the work I do is working with collaborative teams, uh, solving software problems. Uh, and I've lived and worked in a bunch of countries and worked with even more people in all kinds of places. Uh, and I thought I'd just uh, give a bit of a summary of some of the stuff I've learned and some of the techniques I use. Uh, for me, working with international software teams often looks like very early alarms and a lot of knitting on aeroplanes. I do not recommend those alarms. Uh, it also often involves a whole heap of people uh, using he as the default pronoun because turns out that's a thing that happens a lot. Uh, it, it's happened a lot to me when I was living in India for a year and a half working with a software team and I was like, what's going on? Is it like the, is the Hindi or the Kannada or the Tamil word for, uh, you know, third uh, person pronoun uh, always he? And everyone went, no, what are you talking about? Turned out it wasn't an India thing, it was a colonialism thing. Um, hi, colonialism, yeah, when the Britishers, uh, as they are called, they left in uh, 1947, they left 1947 English behind. So all the textbooks only have male pronouns. Nobody ever uses women in any kind of pronoun unless it's for cooking or having children or sometimes in anatomy textbooks. So that took a while to change uh, and, you know, kind of blew people's minds when I, you know, even when most of the software development team was women, just didn't occur to anyone to do it. Uh, it turned out we, you, you can change that. Also kinds of things that happen is that people do really cool quirky things with language. Uh, I don't know how many of you like have learned another language or speak another language, or, yeah. A few people, yeah, yeah. Is it really hard? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, and also really cool things happen, which are sort of like what would happen if Google Translate had a bit of a mind. So people will say things like, yeah, if we're going to do subtraction addition, we're also going to do updation to these fields, uh, which doesn't exist in English, but makes perfect sense. Uh, and I had all these, oh, I had all these impulses to hug people because they were doing such cool things with language, except I had to instead sit down and tell them, uh, if you continue doing this in a professional context, people aren't going to take you seriously. Which broke my heart a little bit, but I had to tell them because one day they're not going to be able to get the right kind of job because they aren't using the right kind of language. And they were doing the same thing to me. They, they'd sit me down and go, you know, the way you phrase that, that's really rude here. Um, all our taxonomies are wrong. Turns out everyone's usually wrong for someone. Uh, who, who's already aware of this? Who's, who's encountered this before? Yeah, 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 yeah. Who's actually changed, like not just languages, but say work fields? Yeah, a few people. Have you noticed how taxonomy changes a lot when you do that? Yep, and people use the same word to mean totally different things. Yeah, it's great. Doesn't cause any problems for anyone ever. Another thing that happens when people move around a lot is that we all, you know, we all make mental shortcuts. People like this are like that. People who are from here behave in those kinds of ways or have these kinds of beliefs. To a point, they're true. Stereotypes are not necessarily untrue. It's just that they're in oversimplifications. They're not untrue, they are incomplete. And all human minds tend toward the, what I like to call single narrative syndrome. There is the one true story that explains all the facts. And the more you deal with life, you know, the, the more we all learn that actually it's more complicated than that, always, forever, on everything. And this is another one of those things where it wasn't always true that the way people behaved were because of the stereotype. For example, uh, 
the China part of the team isn't raising problems early enough. They're just saying yes, and then we find out months later that actually they couldn't do the thing we wanted. Maybe it's because that's a China culture. Maybe it's because the previous delivery lead, who was based in the US, caused them problems. That's not necessarily because of the stereotype. Sometimes it's because people come from different kinds of cultures. So um, some cultures say it's OK to ask anything, and it's OK to say no. And in some cultures, that's not OK. You never ask for something unless you know what the answer is. Or you ask it in a sort of a quiet feeling, the water's outweigh, gee, it'd be really convenient if I, you know, I'm going to be really late if I don't uh, like take a cab this afternoon, but I know you're driving that way. Um, also, would you like some tea? Um, and, and just wait for someone else to offer. And that's a really normal way in another culture to do things. Guest culture looks like passive aggressive, uh, irritating behavior when you're used to ask culture. Yep. And the other way around, what are you doing asking me? I have to say yes now. That means I just have to avoid you forever in case you ask me for things I don't want to say yes to. What also happens is microcultures. Uh, the school you went to at a certain year and the kinds of signs that hung up on the walls that said how to use your nice voice completely changed people's expectations of how it's normal to ask things, how it's normal to behave, what sort of words it's okay to expect to use and expect others to use. Uh, which means that even people who've come from the same kind of place sometimes have difficulty in understanding what the words mean. And that's before we've changed fields or languages or countries or anything like that. That creates problems when we're, doing, when we're making private jokes. Uh, and what constitutes a private joke changes all the time. Like if you make a joke about the grand final and half of your team is in another country and doesn't play AFL, or if you're making a joke about one of the many, many prime ministers your country has had in the past several years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most of us know what that means here. Not everyone does. And when you make that kind of joke without explaining the context, where not everyone knows the context, we're leaving someone out. So someone feels left out of the little group, of the little microculture. And the opposite that, of that is creating like a little tribe, like creating a microculture for us. You know, we, we all now have a private joke. Uh, and everybody knows each other, and everyone feels a little bit closer. And it's a, it's a really good way to create a, a feeling of a team. Another thing to consider is whose governance model wins. But, and that's everything from uh, do, do we have goat tracks or do we have roads that go for scooters or are we building an airport and what time is stand up? What language are we using when we communicate? Who's using, you know, ca can we use Zoom? Can we use whatever mediocre video conferencing technology we're using? They're all mediocre, let's face it. Whichever one we're using, is it accessible to everyone? Are we actually building in time for people to have connection problems at the start of the meeting? Um, I, I take my own photos for all of my slides, which is probably why they're not quite as shiny as other people's, but also why they contain a lot of pictures of goats. <laughs> if you want to talk about goats, find me later. The governance models you create create barriers of entry for someone. And sometimes you're the goat, and sometimes you're the motorcycle. Hello, yeah. Oh, tough crowd. <laughs> uh, but the barriers that you create are sometimes just part of what you need to do. One of the projects I worked on was creating an app for uh, an Ebola clinic during the height of the Ebola epidemic, you know, 2015, West Africa. We had three months to do it. Uh, Ebola is a really difficult uh, disease to treat because you have a quarantined area for everyone and for anyone to go in there, they have to basically crawl into a spacesuit and wear three gloves and uh, very, uh, like extremely tight requirements on what you can physically wear. And of course, it's West Africa, it's hot, it's humid, you can maybe spend 45 minutes running, you know, doing rounds, treating people. You have to do a recording of what you're doing so that the next people are going to know what you're doing. Uh, so in that case, whatever the doctors wanted, won. 
They wanted this word instead of that word. They wanted this instead of that. They wanted clear, clearer UX. That's what they got. And that was reasonable. You know, they, they won because their problems were a lot more important than the software teams. Not always true. We also need to think about, you know, what do we each need to practice in order to be able to make the experience easier for other people? Uh, if you've worked in, if you've ever had a long distance relationship of any sort, personal or professional, you might have figured out that it's, you know, it's possible to maintain a relationship long distance at the same level, but it's very hard to change it over the phone. And it's very hard to solve relationship problems uh, with a more distance. Everyone will tell you have more meetings, keep the video conference open, visit each other when you can. That's a good thing to do if you can. Not all projects can afford it. All relationships that have discussed what sort of a relationship they are tend to survive problems better than relationships that don't. And that's true for personal and professional ones. By the time you're solving a problem within the relationship, if you haven't solved how we communicate and how we resolve problems and what our internal processes are, you're having to figure those out on the fly already while you're in conflict. That's going to hurt. This is why we have codes of conduct before we start conferences, for example. One of the conversations I like to have with people early on is how do you want to have arguments? And the first time somebody asked me that, I, I was shocked. I had no idea how to answer. These days I have an answer, but you know, do you want to shout at me? Do you want a phone call? Do you want time to think about it? Do you want to slack me? Do you want private time? What do you want? What works for you? Uh, that's a part of sort of the code of conduct, part of the ways of communicating that each relationship needs to have. And sometimes it grows naturally, but if you don't know what it is and you haven't agreed on what it is and how you want to change it, if there's a conflict, you're going to have to resolve that while you're in conflict as well, and that's going to suck. Like, don't do it. If you can model good behavior, model good behavior. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. And that's true for communication. And that's true for ways of resolving conflict. That's true for all kinds of things. And if you're not normalizing conflict resolution, you're normalizing unresolved conflict. Again, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. Uh, and what I've learned is that there's no such thing as a small thing, especially when someone's remote. Like if I'm saving it for retro at the end of the month, or if I'm saving it for a private conversation in two weeks' time, we're not going to get to the little thing of, hey, the way you use that word can make some people feel left out. That's a, that's a really good conversation to have early, to have quickly. It's awkward. It's OK. Be awkward. Uh, Micro-adult, in the same way that you're creating microcultures, create micro-adulting experiences for yourself. And the more you do that, you, the more you make it normal for other people to do that. Have the awkward conversation early. Do, do it as often and early as you can. Put out the fires before they're big fires. Yeah, the, the thing I learned is that adulting is for people who don't want to cry more later. You either cry a little bit now or more later. Adulting is paying off your tech debt early, is what it is, because there's always interest on whatever debt you've got, whether it's technical or social. And you might not know what it is yet, but you will sooner or later. And sometimes it's just that you don't know how to resolve conflicts when they do happen and when you need to do it. Yeah, if you don't have a lot of big crap meetings where nothing gets resolved, you're going to have to resolve everything before you get into the meeting. I'm sorry. Dealing with people requires dealing with people. And I know that's not always everyone's favorite way to do things, but it is the thing. Find ways to talk to people individually. Have all the pre-meeting meetings. One of my favorite ways to do pre-meeting meetings is once a week, I will make sure that I've contacted everyone on my team, and I don't care if they're the GM of my area, or if they're somebody I barely talk to, or if they're the person I sit next to every day. What have you done this week that you're proud of? There's always something. And if you can tell me, and there, you can always tell me something, you get a sticker. It's a non-food reward, and it's awesome. And it gives me an excuse to talk to people. And it gives me a sense of how they calibrate achievement, both in themselves and in other people. And it means that we all get to know each other a bit. 
Also, the only people who've ever asked me back are people who do QA. <laughs> Fun fact. Uh, the thing to remember is that when we're changing relationships, we're all hacking each other, like it's all culture hacking. People are hacking my culture, I'm hacking their culture, we're all changing our relationship. We're creating conflict. Conflict is not necessarily bad, but conflict needs resolution. So, conflict resolution 101, you take the word you out of conversation, it's all I statements. When this happened, I felt like this. It's not you should do this, it's how might we, how can we resolve this. Those kinds of statements are true for people who know and have grown up in a culture where those kinds of uh, statements and that kind of language mean something, where they can interpret what people are trying to say. Somebody who grows up in a different culture and doesn't know what those phrases mean, don't understand that what I'm trying to do is resolve conflict and try and make people feel unantagonized. Sometimes the thing to say is, um, you did this thing and it was a problem because, and I expect you to do X, Y, Z later because that way I'm taking out the burden of other people second guessing <laughs> my cultural doublespeak because it's doublespeak, you know, people have to interpret things and we all know how to interpret some stuff, but not necessarily everyone's stuff. And I had to learn the hard way when to, when to use the kinds of statements that in other situations are just incendiary and inflammatory and make problems and escalate situations. In some situations, they de-escalate things. The hard part is knowing when to use which. Um, yeah, the unconscious bias. We've all heard of unconscious bias, yep. Yeah, we all have an unconscious bias to, for example, like people like us, or to trust the opinion of people who we identify with in some way. One of the ways to do that is if you have a good relationship with somebody, it is possible to help de-escalate conflicts that they're having with someone else. I use the unconscious bias to drag my male friends to talks about feminism. You use it in your own, in your own way. Another thing that I do to create cultures is that I uh, create cultures and I, you know, I enforce things and I enforce things early and I model good behavior and then I step away. Uh, I sometimes have opportunities planned or otherwise to, for example, disappear for a few weeks. And one of the things that can happen is that while I'm away, people start filling in the role of how to set microcultures and how to connect the team properly without me. And if I've done my job right and I've made sure that other people know how to do that, it all happens organically and I come back and everything's great. And someone else is suddenly the BA or the project manager for this bit and someone else has taken over sticker time. When someone else takes over sticker time, I am the happiest. Like that's when I know things are great. The main thing I've learned is that you can't create strategy without creating strategy for changing culture. If things are going to be changing, if you need things to change, you need to be able to create a plan for how to change the culture around things. And it doesn't matter what else you do, if, if you're trying to change people's minds, you're gonna to have to work within their culture and they're gonna to have to work within yours. And not everyone knows that, but I know that, so I can do something about it. Ooh, wrong slide, this way. Okay, here are more places where you can look up resources. There are a gajillion places to look up resources. Uh, go do a communication course. Um, play around with it. Go do some anthropology stuff. Do what you need to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, that was brilliant. Um, I think we unfortunately don't have any time for questions. Um, because we only have five minutes to the next speaker and it's tightly jam-packed, but please cool. thank one more time.